Hey everyone, welcome to Eastview Online. We appreciate you choosing to spend your time with us today. And we're actually starting a new series and it's called The End. That's right, it's the beginning of the end. This series is all about the end times. You probably have a lot of questions on what that's like, what Eastview thinks about that. And we hope in the series that we can be helpful and encouraging in light of kind of a, a difficult topic at times. So that's starting today. Uh, and one thing you should know, if you've been joining us online for a while, we have this incredible event called Starting Point Online. It's an opportunity for you to find your people in places. If you go to eastview.church slash sponline, you can see when all the upcoming events are happening. But the one that's coming up soonest is uh, July 24th, 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. Again, uh, it's a web-based event. You can join on Zoom and everyone who attends gets a $5 Dairy Queen gift card. So I'd invite you to check that out. It's a great next step for you. Uh, and we're excited for the service today. So that's starting right after this. And we hope you enjoy. Hey, good morning, Eastview. Why don't you stand with us as we get to praise and worship our King. If you're out in the foyer, come on in and join us. Uh, we are excited to introduce a new song to you guys called House of the Lord. But before I do that, I want to show you guys a picture of last week. This is an overhead picture of thousands of us gathering together, uh, celebrating. If you guys were there, you know how much fun that was. And uh, guy, we just, we just had a lot of fun together as a church family. And we know that the house of the Lord is not a building. It is his people coming together, lifting high his name. And so we wanna share this new song with you called House of the Lord. the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet, we'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet, we'll shout out your praise. Oh, we'll shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross and he rose up from that grave. My God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. Forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We'll 
Amen.
And we trust you, we trust you, your ways are higher than our own. We trust you, we trust you, so your ways are higher than our own. We trust you. Jesus, we trust you. Your ways are higher than our own. We trust you forever. We trust you. Your ways are higher than our own. From heaven's throne, you came to us and set your heart upon the cross. We'll never know the sacrifice you made for all our sin and all our shame. You took the nails and took our place. No one else can do what you have done. One name. One name is higher. One name is stronger than any grave, than any throne. Christ exalted over all. From the grave. Where death would die, you rose again and brought us life. You're reigning now, the Savior of the world. You're reigning now, the Savior of the world. One name is higher. One name is true. We sing your praise, we sing your praise forever. We lift your name, we lift your name, Jesus. 
us over all. Sing that again, church. We sing your praise. We sing your praise. We sing your praise forever. We lift your name. We lift your name. Jesus over all. God, we truly lift your name. You are worthy. You are worthy, God. You guys go ahead and have a seat. Here at Eastview, each week, we take communion together. So I'm going to ask you to go ahead and get your cups out. And we do this not out of mundane ritual. We do this because the word of God reminds us and tells us when we gather together, remember my sacrifice, Jesus says. So we come together to remember the sacrifice, what God has done for us by giving his son and the son's life for ours. And last week, Mike, when he spoke to us, he, he talked about how the culture is trying to push their agenda and push their truth, like there's an individual truth in each and every one of us, and debunking that myth and saying, no, there's only one truth, and it's the word of God, period. There's, there's, it's not up for debate. It is the word of God. The inerrant, infallible word of God is truth, and that's what we base our lives off of. We don't try to make it fit our lives. We fit our lives according to its truth. And we wanted to take a moment and just say that with boldness. Say that unashamed. We're not ashamed of the truth of the word of God. It has stood the test of time before we came along and long after we'll be gone. It's his word. And we stand on that. And so we wanted to give us a, a collective moment to reflect and say, it's his truth. It's his way. We just sang it. Your ways are higher than our own. You are exalted above all. So I'm going to give you just a little bit of time to just reflect on that. And when you're ready, go ahead and take the elements. And then we're going to sing in just a second again. But just take time to remember it's his truth, his way.
Lord, that is our prayer this morning. It's your word that brings truth and light to our minds and our hearts. It's your word that gives us eyes and ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is speaking, drawing us back to your son again and again and again. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, good morning, Eastview Christian Church. You guys doing okay? You awake? I hope you're awake because we're talking about being awake in this sermon. So uh, it's good to be w- with you all this morning. We're starting our new uh, four-week series here in the month of July. And as most of you probably know, some of you may not, this is usually the time when Mike takes a little bit of a break to go and rest, rejuvenate, relax with his family in preparation for the fall. So for the next four weeks, you guys are going to be hearing from different preachers here at ECU, which I think is exciting. Um, now, you would think with Mike being gone, he would, he would lob the non-regulars just some easy hit-it-out-of-the-park passages, right? So naturally, today we begin our series on the end times, <laughs> okay? <laughs> We're talking end times today, and you guys get one of the youth pastors for the first one. So congratulations. Uh, happy for you guys. <laughs> In all seriousness, though, uh, after studying the passage for this, mor- uh, this morning all week, um, there's a lot of stuff that I believe the Lord wants to speak to us today. And I, and I want to preface today's message uh, with this. I'm not here today to make a bunch of predictions about the end times, to get specific about dates and what it, like, exactly is going to happen, because sometimes end times talk can be more of a distraction than leading to a call to action. All right, and that's not what we want today. I, actually, it was kind of funny. This, this past week, we received like this really thick packet of like why the end of the world is going to happen in like the specific date in 2026. And I was like, that's not what I'm doing today, okay? Here's all the reasons why this date, okay? That's not what we're doing um, uh, because the truth is there's a lot out there when it comes to this topic about the end times. There's a lot of theories, a lot of, a lot of stuff out there. And, and because even though we have the word of God, I, I want to share with you guys and I want you to know that a lot of who God is is a mystery, and a lot of, of God and revealing himself is not going to be fully revealed to us. The mystery is not going to be completely known until we're with him in heaven again. All right. And, and, and so I think that's important to know. And I also want you to know this morning I am here to preach Jesus through his written word. And, and so we're going to look at this passage. And, and my hope is, is that this series will encourage us to live more faithful in the present because of what's promised in the future. All right. That's what we're getting at today. So if you guys have your Bibles, open up to Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13 is where we're going to be. And as you guys flip open to that, I want to just share a little bit into the high school world this past week. So our high school team has been preparing and prepping for our upcoming trip to CIY. Uh, CIY, I know. We're we're pumped for it. We're excited. So tomorrow, I, I don't know if you guys know this, we're going to load almost 200 high school students onto buses and take them up to Wheaton College, where they're going to spend five days worshiping the Lord, having intentional conversations in small groups, playing games and activities in their free time, building relationships. I mean, this week is awesome. And we found that this week is one of the best places where some students make a decision to follow Jesus for the first time. A lot of students take a big step in their faith during this week. And for a few, like myself, my own testimony, it's where some students decide, I want to go into vocational ministry for the rest of my life. That's what happened to me at CIY, and so those things happen. And part of what makes this trip so successful in high school ministry is something that that isn't the great speakers. It it isn't necessarily the the worship team and the awesome band. It isn't even the small group talk. No, what, what I want to talk about today, what makes this trip so successful is the hard curfew. Okay? You are in your room, in bed, at midnight, all right? And, and, and we tell our leaders, you make sure they are going to sleep because we found when students get sleep, there's less tears, okay? There's less drama, and most important to my heart, there's less sleeping during the sermon, all right? So uh, it, it's funny because in my years of attending and leading, I, I remember these, these moments where I'd be listening to this speaker and I'd be like, man, they are just 
they're just nailing it. They're, they're, they're hitting it out of the park with the, just this truth. And, and I think about this person in my group that I know needs to hear this. And I'm like, Let, let's call him Jack. You know, and like, man, I'm so glad Jack is hearing this right now. Like, oh, I bet his heart is changing. Things are happening. He's going to make a big decision tonight. And I look over and this dude is just knocked out, right? <laughs> Fast asleep, like sh- chin in the shoulder, Right. And, and so it always leads to like getting the buddy next to him, like nudge him, like hit him, right? And then I look at him, I'm like, hey, stay awake, pay attention. You're gonna miss something that God has for you. And so here's to next week, spending five days nudging students saying, don't fall asleep, stay awake, right? And, and in our passage today, that's the big thing Jesus is getting at here with his disciples as we talk about these last days, All right, so during these last days, the big thing is be on your guard. Be on your guard. Be ready because God is up to something. So here's my encouragement for us today as East U Christian Church, as Christ followers, as we open the word of God, let's just be on our guard. Let's stay awake and watch for signs that God is a lot closer than you might think. That God is here and he is present and he is near and he is ready to do something. So, Mark chapter 13, starting in verse 1. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginnings of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given to you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit." And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Let me pray for us this morning. God, there is a lot here, and, and I know, we know that you are here, and you're moving, and you're ready to speak. And so, God, I pray your word would be proclaimed, your son Jesus would be praised this morning, that we would be awake for what you have for us. God, how you're calling us to live actively in the present right now and await expectantly for this promised future. And so God, I pray you get rid of any distractions that we could focus in and hear your word. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. So I only got to like the first piece of this long conversation, and and through this sermon, we're going to kind of be getting to different pieces of it going a little farther. But this long conversation that Jeter, Jeter, Derek Jeter? No. Uh, This long conversation that Jesus has with Peter, James, John, and Andrew all begins with somebody in the group making a comment about Herod's temple. And, And this temple would have been huge. All right, this temple was twice the size of Solomon's original temple back in the Old Testament. And so Herod like outdid himself. He did this crazy job, built this thing ginormous. And so people would have walked by this and just been mesmerized by it. And that's what happens with these disciples. They look at this building and they're like, wow, look at the wonderful stones. Look at the buildings. Wow, Herod did an awesome, awesome job. And Jesus seems very unimpressed in his response. He says, yeah, you see that building, it's not one stone upon the other is not going to come crashing to the ground, right? Which is like, man, mood kill. Like, look at how awesome it is. It's not that great. Oh, okay, right? And that's what Jesus is getting at here because this whole dialogue going into the last days by sharing these truths, Jesus is hinting at here two things. 
Number one, this world is temporary. What you see as magnificent on this earth, what you see as amazing, it's not going to last. It will eventually be gone. And number two is Jesus is looking at this temple and it's like, this thing's not going to matter. Because the atonement that was happening in the temple through sacrifice, no, I'm here now and I'm atoning for all sins. I, I, I cover what the temple could only cover a little bit. I cover everything, right? So the world is temporary. The temple will no longer be necessary. Jesus is setting up a truth that the disciples need to understand before we get into the talk about these last days. And it is this. This world is not all there is, so quit living like it is. This world is not all it is. So quit living like it is because the minute we start living as if this is all I got, I get life here on earth and that's it, is the moment we miss something God is doing in us for later. All right, so we we cannot live as if this is all there is. We live with this promise expected future that God gives us. And so here's the thing, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, they're obviously curious here. Jesus says something about the temple being destroyed. They're like, what's up with that? And so they ask in verse four, They're like, okay, well, when are these things going to be? What will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And two things to note before we kind of dive into that question. We kind of have two different future contexts here that we want to address. Number one is there is this near future context. Because in the year 66, this guy by the name of Titus is going to come in and he's going to destroy the temple and destroy Jerusalem. It's very well possible that Jesus is hinting at he's predicting that this event where Jerusalem is going to come and be destroyed in year 66, that's what he's talking about here. But Jesus is also getting at a broader, farther future context of me coming back. Judgment happening on the world, the second coming of Jesus happening. And so what we need to do is we need to look at this in the context that there is the near future context and there is also a farther future context. And so as we think today, What does it look like for a Christ follower to live in these last days? Let's look at Jesus, because Jesus has some things to say about what that means. First thing, during these last days, watch for signs. Watch for signs. Be attentive to what is happening in the world. These disciples, they ask, what's going to be the sign when all these things are accomplished? And that leads Jesus to go into the long monologue, starting in verse 6. I want to read verse verse 5 and verse 6 here. It says, Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. Jesus shares a sign to look for. If we're looking for signs, something to look for in living in these last days is those that are going to come and they're going to claim that they're Jesus, that they're the Christ. All right, and if we're thinking in our present day, relevant to today, I see that as those that come and they claim, I am speaking on behalf of Jesus. I am speaking truth that is far from the truth, right? And and we're living in a world today where a lot of statements, a lot of ways we live are leading Christ followers astray. Statements like, Jesus just wants you to be happy. Jesus is, he's cool with your choices and cool with your sin. The whole Bible isn't necessarily true, The Old Testament God is different than the New Testament God. I can go on and on and on with things that have creeped in, that sometimes we live like those things are true. As we live in the last days, we have to be watchful for the things we hear that actually might sound really good. That, oh, that that sounds maybe right. Just to be attentive that, is this true? And, and sometimes I even want to, I, I want our students to ask and, and, and maybe offer you guys to ask this question. If you hear something that's like, I've never heard that before, just to perk your ears up a little bit, to be attentive. Is it because the word of God is being opened to you in a new way or is it because that's not true? To be attentive to what we're hearing, to what is going into our minds, to what these false prophets are doing. And, and Jesus gets at it even further. If you go on into the chapter, verse 21 through 23, Jesus says, if anyone says to you, hey, look, here's the Christ, or look, there he is, don't believe it. For false prophets and false Christs will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all these things beforehand. Now, real quick, a note on the elect. Jesus isn't getting at some proud elite here. He's talking about the elect as recipients of God's grace. What he's getting at is this is a warning for Christ followers. This isn't just a warning to the world saying you guys are all being led astray. No, Jesus is getting right at the church here and he's saying, you guys could be led astray here. Watch out. 
right? When in doubt, we cling to what is true. We cling to what never passes away, and that's the word of God. It's why here at Eastview we will always open this up and we will preach this. It's why I can stand up here on a stage and be confident that I'm preaching truth if I'm preaching this, right? If I get away from this, if I start offering my own opinions, don't listen to me. But if I'm preaching this, you can trust it because this is true, right? J- Jason was talking about the inerrant, infallible word of God. And so Jesus, after this warning about false prophets, goes into details about an, some other signs that the disciples should just be attentive to in these last days, and, and we should look out for too. A lot of the things that Jesus gets at here has to do with a hostile world, a world that's broken, a world that's you know, has a lot of evil going on in it. And, and Jesus gets at a bunch of different things. If you look in verse eight, he talks about nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, earthquakes and famines. Then he talks about down in verse 13 that you'll be hated for my namesake. And then he has this weird, like scary kind of thing in verse 12 where it's like brother is gonna go against brother, father against child, children against parents, right? All of these things are happening. And if we look at this, Nation against nation, look at our world today. Nation is against nation, right? Russia and Ukraine, United States, China, you know, Syria, Israel, you name it. Nations are going against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. You look at regimes in different countries. You think about the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of man. These things are happening today. Natural disasters, a pandemic, you know, hurricanes, earthquakes, famines, these things are happening today. I don't, family divisions, the the family unit is still falling apart. Marriages aren't as important. Single family homes are still growing, right? We're in this. And then of course, persecution. Christians across the world are still being persecuted for their faith. The thing is, we look at this and Jesus is saying, if these are the signs of these last days, I would suggest we're smack dab in the middle of it. We're living in these last days. And a a quick note for any skeptic in the room or watching online, it's pretty interesting how spot on Jesus is about what's going to happen in the world. I'm just offering that, all right? It's pretty cool that Jesus would say exactly what's going on, right? But the encouragement I want to point us to is not one of fear to look at this and, and be afraid. It's not one of judgment to judge the world. It's It's not one to look at this and start making specific predictions about exactly what this is all going to look like and be distracted about what God's doing in the now. But it should be one of intentional attentiveness to look at the world and say, yeah, that's a sign. That's a sign. That's a sign. This is a broken world. This world needs Jesus. And to quit running to the things of this world as if it's going to heal us, as if it's going to cleanse us. It's not. To be watchful Being watchful of these things means looking at it and saying, I need to get closer to Jesus because he's near, right? I look at the world, I acknowledge the world is a lot like this, and my response is, I have got to get close to Jesus now. I've got to get right with God. Living in these last days, it means watching for signs, just being attentive to the world and knowing what it could mean, all right? Second, During these last days, stay awake. Stay awake. Don't fall asleep. In my years uh, growing up playing sports, there was this like common thing that we, that would go with any sort of sport, basketball, golf, volleyball, you name it. The thing is, when it comes to the end of a game, the end of a match, the end of a point, that is the time you have to mentally and physically lock in. You've got to focus in. Those are the most important moments, the last two minutes of a game, the very last point. You have to focus in. Don't lose your focus. The thing is also, it's also the hardest time to focus in. That's when you're the most physically and mentally exhausted. It's hard to focus in. It's why we get so frustrated with our basketball teams that can't make free throws, right? Just make a free throw. There's no one in front of you. How hard could it be, right? But if it's at the end of a game, You have to consider they're exhausted, and it's a lot harder than maybe it looks, but that's the time you have to focus in. For golf, I I, I struggle with this idea. Listen, I may be one of the best golfers for the first 15 holes, but then I fall apart in the last three, all right? 
because we get tired. We get ex- I get exhausted. I lose my focus when I should be focusing in. In volleyball, I'm, te- I'm teaching you all of these things in sports. I hope that's okay. Um, I like sports. Uh, in volleyball, an unwritten rule is if you are serving for game point, don't miss the serve. <laughs> don't miss the serve. Get the serve in because at least you have a chance to win the point. The thing is, when the game is coming to an end, that's when you need to be the most alert and the most ready and the most focused. And that's what we're getting at here. As we're living in these last days, now is not the time to fall asleep. Now is not the time to get lazy in our faith, to get apathetic in our walk with Jesus. Because if these are the signs to look for, if Jesus is saying, if you see these things, you know the end is near. If we see that, then we need to realize that we're in this. Now is not the time to go through the motions. Now is not the time to sit back, relax, and just wait for Jesus to come, but be active in my faith. Not to get swept up in all the lies of the world, but to stay awake. There is an urgency to this. And and the truth is, yes, Jesus might be here very soon. Very soon. So, what are the ways we stay awake? How can we as Christ followers be ready to stay awake in these last days? There's a few things that Jesus talks about. Number one is bear witness, is bear witness. If you look in verse nine through verse 11, Jesus is telling his disciples, hey guys, be on your guard. You're gonna go before councils, you're gonna go before synagogues, and you're gonna have to bear witness in my name. You gotta be ready for this. And in these last days, We are going to have opportunities to be a light for Jesus, to actually verbally proclaim the answer to the brokenness in this world and in our hearts. And Jesus was telling his disciples, hey guys, this is exactly what it's gonna look like. You're gonna go before these councils, before these synagogues, and you're gonna bear witness. And guess what? That's exactly what happened. If you read the book of Acts, that's exactly what the disciples do. It is all about them going before the people and bearing witness for the name of Jesus. Right, and and, and so this applies to us today as well. I don't wanna miss the very end of, of Mark. Jesus tells his disciples, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Guess what, we still count as the whole creation. So that means we don't get out of this bearing witness. We are called to bear witness. So how do we stay awake, not become stagnant, not become asleep, apathetic as we live in this world right now? I wanna be brutally honest with us and push us to go a little bit further in our proclaiming of the gospel, we actually need to really start practicing this. And instead of just thinking, I need to go and share my faith or I need to go and be a light to this person, actually doing it. Saying something, it doesn't have to be this either grand thing either, just we actually need to start practicing this instead of just saying it over and over and over again. Because the thing is, we become asleep, lackadaisical in our witness when we don't live in this reality that these are the last days. If we sit on our couch and think, yeah, that that coworker, that friend, that family member, they need to know Jesus. I get it, it's urgent. And we just stay on the couch. I, I, I think we do understand this, but when we don't cooperate with the spirit, which is those little nudges that like, I should probably say something, I should probably do something. When we don't cooperate, we lose the urgency of God's mission. You see, cooperating with the Spirit grows in us an urgency of God's mission because God's mission is that everyone should reach repentance. When we are actually practicing, when I am actually going and telling a friend about Jesus, inviting them to church, it is growing in me a heart for those to reach repentance. We've gotta get active with our bearing witness. Number two, how do we stay awake? How do we not fall asleep? Jesus talks a lot about enduring to the end, all right? Verse 13, the very end, he says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Staying awake in these last days is going to mean enduring some sort of suffering because we are living in a broken world. And it's gonna mean choosing to remain faithful to the one that promises, I'm going to get you out of this. But we need to understand this. Maybe this is a wake-up call. Hey, this is not gonna be easy. If we are really living in these last days, it's going to be hard. You're gonna face some trials. Endure, hold on. Jesus mentions actually some pretty intense stuff here, not to mention all of the nation against nation and brother against brother and all of these things happening, but I didn't even get to the part where it's talking about in verse 14 on down, this idea of the abomination of desolation and, and to be honest, this is one of the more confusing passages 
in scripture of what we're talking about here. Some are saying that, that Jesus is talking about Satan here and his dominion here on earth. Some say that this is some future antichrist. Some say that this is just what we're talking about when the, the temple was destroyed in the year 66. And, and Jesus goes even further. He talks about tribulation and these years of judgment. And a lot of people look at this and is like, is this going to happen? Is it happening now? Did it already happen? I don't have time to get into what's Zach's opinion on this. But we can look at this word and we can understand the truth of these things. Number one is the world is going to be judged because this world is broken and sinful. And number two, this world that is deserving of judgment for now has Satan prowling around like a roaring lion. Right? First Peter 5.8. It's the same language we're talking about here. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour a hostile world and a real enemy is going to mean a life of endurance. All right, I, I don't know if that's a wake-up call to us to say, I, once I follow Jesus, I, it, everything's just gonna be awesome. We live in a hostile world with a real enemy. It's gonna, you're gonna have to endure things and I don't have to name a bunch of examples because I'm sure even in this past year, you can look at what it looks like to live in a broken world or live a life that angers a prowling lion and you can see what you have to endure. It's why Jesus says, hey guys, stay awake, endure to the end. Don't throw in the towel. Hold on just a little bit longer because you have this promise coming. I love this passage from Hebrews. It says, therefore, do not throw away your confidence. Don't throw in the towel, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised for, and yet a little while, And the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But church, this is, cling to this. This is, this needs to be us. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. We don't shrink back in a hostile world with a devil that prowls around. We don't shrink back in our own suffering, but we stand firm in our faith knowing of what is promised. I also wanted to throw in this passage from 2 Timothy because I think it's really relevant to exactly what we're talking about today. For the time is coming when people will not, here's the word again, endure sound teaching. But they have itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Does that not sound like the world today? I'm going to listen to those that say what I want to hear. It's happening. And then we're getting at exactly what we're talking about. But as for you, be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist or bear witness, fulfill your ministry. Endure suffering. If you want to stay awake in these last days, bear witness, endure suffering. And number three, to understand that no one knows the day or the hour. This could happen at any moment when Jesus comes back. Flip over to the very end of chapter 13 with me. Mark chapter 13, verse 32 through 37. It says, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, For you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For you do not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, it's saying over and over, you guys, I hope you get it. Stay awake. Stay awake. Staying awake in these last days means understanding that Jesus could be here at any moment and to live like that. That Jesus could be here at any moment. That should change how I live my day to day. That should change how I interact with my coworkers, with my family, with my friends. There is an urgency to this, that this could happen at any moment. Growing up around the elementary school age, I got big, I got like into big time the left behind books. Do you guys know like the Left Behind series? Okay, for those of you that don't know, it was this fictional 
like series about the rapture and that one day all the Christians are going to disappear and go up to heaven and everyone else is going to be left behind. Okay? I was terrified of this. I remember Saturday mornings or days after school, I would get home and it'd be like a minute and I couldn't find my parents. And I'd be like, it happened. <laughs> I was left behind. I, I literally would search, search around the house for like a pile of clothes and jewelry. It's like, there was mom, right? Which was really funny. After I shared this story, my wife, Natasha, was like, you know, I'm just going to go home and put a pile of clothes on the ground. <laughs> But I remember for a few days after kind of getting into these books, I would walk around and carry my Bible with me everywhere. Anywhere I went, I would have my Bible in my hands because I was like, if it comes time, Jesus is going to, he's going to look down and see Zach and he's like, oh, he's holding his Bible. Okay, we'll take it, right? I wanted to be ready. I wanted to be ready for this moment. Now, left behind, it's funny, it's fictional, it's not super theological, um, But the thing is, I I thought about this, and I'm like, I do feel like sometimes we need to live with this kind of urgency and expectation, that I, I wanna be ready. I wanna be ready for this moment that happens. Jesus says in Revelation 16, 15, he says, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. What Jesus is getting at here is you don't want to be found in your sin and your shame. Be found in the forgiveness and the freedom of Jesus. Be ready. That you can live in this now. And we have this promise, everyone. Look, I didn't get to this, passage, this part either, but if you look in verse 24 through 27, there is a promise that the coming of the Son of Man is going to happen. Jesus is going to come back. We have this promise. We need to live with the promise that he is coming This is going to happen. And so as we live in these last days, we want to watch for signs, to be attentive to the world, right? We want to stay awake, to not be found asleep. And and, and finally, this morning, I would love for us during these last days to take a lesson from a fig tree. All right, Jesus throws in this passage what I thought was a random story about a fig tree. We're talking about a fig tree now? but it actually applies greatly. And if you guys didn't know, I was assigned 37 verses this morning. So I've tried to get to most of it, all right? But there's gonna be some that are left out. I'm sorry if I disappointed you on some things, but I wanna get to this story. Mark 13, verse 28 through 31. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. As we look at the world and we look at the words of Jesus, I believe it is safe to say we are living in these last days, which means according to God's word, according to Jesus, he is very, very close. He's very close. But I don't think he's just talking about I'm coming soon. I do think he's talking about that, that I'm coming soon. But by the power of the cross and Jesus' death and resurrection, Jesus is close right now. We shouldn't be living as if Jesus is close, he's coming back and I'm just gonna wait for that day, but, but I can live in this reality right now that Jesus is here, that the kingdom of God is close, that I can experience what heaven is going to be right now here on earth with Jesus close Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with them and he with me. Jesus is saying, you want to know how close I am? I'm right outside and I'm knocking. If you open the door and let me in, look what's happening. Look what happens. And so our response today is to take advantage of how close the Lord is to you right now to live right now in the present, in step with the Spirit. Not to just wait for what's coming, to expect what's coming, to lean on that promise, but to live right now differently. Because here's the thing, I believe if Jesus didn't want us to live any differently right now, if we were just in a holding room waiting to go to heaven, 
and just waiting for this. Jesus would have just said, hey, I'm probably coming back at some point, and that's it. But Jesus, he didn't do that. He gave us signs to look for. He gave us promises to cling to, and he gave us instructions to obey so that we might live faithfully in the present to be carriers of the gospel, to intercede for this broken world and for the people in our lives that have yet to reach repentance. This is an active thing. We're not gonna sit and wait. We're gonna be active and we're gonna watch as God moves in this world. And so the application this morning is very simple. The best way to be on your guard, to stay awake during these last days, is to get close to the one who told you to. The response this morning is to say, I gotta get closer to Jesus. I gotta get closer to him. I gotta cling to his promises. I gotta be near. And one of the best ways that Jesus offers this to us is to pray. We get close to God when we come and we have intimate prayer time with him. And can I offer this morning what we need to pray for? Number one, to pray for these things happening here in these last days. Number one, to pray for truth to be revealed and lies to be silenced. To pray for a hostile world. To pray for courage to bear witness, to pray for endurance when I go through hard things and suffering, and to pray when that moment comes, when Jesus comes back, that I am ready. I'll leave you guys with this, a verse from Psalm. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Amen. Stand with us. The splendor of a king clothed in majesty. Let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light. Darkness tries to hide, trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great. Is our God age to age he stands and time is in his hands beginning and the end beginning and the end the Godhead Three in one Father, Spirit, and Son The Lion and the Lamb The Lion and the Lamb How great is our God Sing with me How great is our God And oh Sing with me, how great is our God.
And oh, you see how great, how great is our God. Come on, voices, let's sing that again. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. And all you see how great, how great is our God. Amen. Amen. Yeah. God, that's our prayer. Jesus, you're the one, right, above everything else in our life. Whatever we have going on, God, we place it at your feet because you are greater than all of those things. We ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You know, often we talk about this idea, this notion of giving, and often we even say, hey, this is a mark of maturity as you're growing in your relationship with Jesus. Sometimes 2 Corinthians 9, 7 is even mentioned. It's a pretty famous passage where uh, it's quoted and God is saying, God loves a cheerful giver. It's talking about our heart, right? The condition of what's going on as we're giving. But there's even more than that. And I don't want to stop there. I just want to highlight this for a second. Verses 10 and 11, listen to these words. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. That's probably good for us in central Illinois, I think. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity within you. You will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when you take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So not only is it, yes, a cheerful heart, condition of our heart, but there's other things at play as well, a harvest of generosity. There's needs being met and then ultimately all of those things equate to praises being lifted back up to our God. Just like what we just said, how great are you, God? I say all of that because when you give, sometimes we just might think it's an act. Like, yeah, I'm giving a tithe or I'm giving an offering. But there's so much more that happens that we don't get privy to see all the time. I just pray that you get to see that in your faithful giving. Thank you for doing that. Just as a reminder, uh, you can give online or you can give on your way out. But it does matter when we give. So many things are happening it's an act of trust. So thank you in the midst of all of that. Hey, for those of you who are joining uh, Eastview for the first time, or maybe this is your first couple of times, I just want to give you a special welcome. We think that this is a pretty cool place and that you will find your home here as a family. And so before you leave today, we'd love to get to know you. We have a free gift for you. It's in our family room, which is just right outside these doors at the lower level and by the, uh, across from the cafe. Uh, don't leave without saying hello to somebody. And for the rest of us who are like, yep, I know about the family room. Well, you may or may not know this, but it's for you as well. I just know as I look across the room, we are carrying so much. And we br we're bringing a lot of burdens. There's a lot of things that we're wrestling through. That's a place where you can just come and be and get prayed over. And so if you need prayer today, don't leave without having gone uh, to the family room. All right, a couple of family announcements for you. This one is the big one that I want to bring to your attention you guys know that we've had a, a food pantry for quite a long time. And it's been pretty pivotal within our community uh, for a number of years. And more recently, we've housed it over at the Bloomington campus. But we've actually moved that all the way back here to the normal campus. And so starting this Tuesday, uh, our food pantry is going to be run out of uh, this site along the way. And so the announcement is that food pantry, normal campus, Tuesdays, Wednesdays. If you don't remember anything else, that'll, that'll get you going. But uh, from a time standpoint, on Tuesdays, uh, we're going to be available 1 to 3. On Wednesdays, we have 10 to noon and then 6 to 7.30. But the food pantry is for us. It's for anybody that we know within our community that is in need. And so I give that information to you and trust that you'll pass that on to other people. We're super excited for it. In fact, if you're interested in serving, you can just go on eastview.church slash enews, and there's a way for you to volunteer in our food pantry and help those around us. One more thing is that I just encourage you to read the e-news because there's some things coming up that are gonna be really important. And you may or may not have known this, but Mike uh, dropped his second episode of Apologia this week. And so you can find more information on that uh, in the e-news as well. So a couple more things. One, we get to celebrate a, a life transformation through baptism. Check this out.
This is my daughter Zoe Pichetti, and ironically enough, today's sermon is somewhat correlated to her decision uh, to be baptized today. Um, she's been wanting to be baptized for a while, and about a month ago, we were talking about how the world is just going through a lot of crazy things and uh, what we'll experience as Christians. And um, she stops me in the middle of the conversation and she says, Dad, it's okay because Jesus is coming back soon. And that put a lot of joy in my heart. So it gives me great joy to baptize you today, Zoe. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God? Yes. And have you accepted him as your Lord and personal savior? Yes. With that confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Death, burial, and resurrection. Amen. What a great thing to celebrate. How cool is that, right? All right, one more thing is Zach challenged us in these end times, one of the things to stay awake is to pray. And so we encourage you daily, set aside time to pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you, to help you discern the times, but then also how to best respond and love people around you. That's the challenge for this week, all right? Guys, thanks so much for joining us. Have a great week. We'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us for service today. I just wanted to remind you that Starting Point Online is happening July 24th. Again, you can go to ec.church slash sponline and register there. And I'll be there. I'd love to meet you and get to know you and help you find your people and places through our online campus. And we'll see you next time as we continue this series called The End.